drug response in cellular populations, as you're all very capable of reading up on the screen. But I thought I'd say it anyway. So take it away. Thanks. So is my microphone working now in the room? Can you hear me in the back? First. Oh, great, great. The first time I remember wearing a microphone, I had to teach this class, and it was a multi-segment class um, that went across several hours. And so there was a break in the middle. I got to the end of my first lecture, and I was like, man, I've got to use the bathroom. And so I went tearing off to the bathroom. And then I came back, and I noticed like everybody seemed to be like looking at the ground, not really looking me in the eye. And so then I got to lecturing in the next part of the lecture, and like it hit me all of a sudden. I was like, wait a second. I kept my microphone on when I went to the bathroom, didn't I, guys? And then everybody busted out laughing. And, and they still don't respect me now. So, um, so I'm going to tell you about some work um, on the multi-drug response in bacteria. Um, so I'm going to start out by telling you that antibiotic resistance is a big problem. So I don't think anybody's going to argue with that too much. Um, you can look up various statistics, and, and various public health organizations have said, you know, it's a huge problem. CDC ranked it the number one public health threat in 2014. Um, you can see a lot of things. Um, you know, these are just two examples from a quick Google search. Um, these are actually about pediatric infections. Um, I, had a son, I have a son now who's one, so I tend to think a lot in terms of pediatric stuff, even though that's, that's the extent of my pediatric training. Um, but, but I tend to think about it. And so these things can be, of course, really bad for, for children. Um, but, but I assume everybody will, will take that um, and, and believe me on that. And so the question is, how do we solve this you know, very big problem? Um, and, and what I would characterize as sort of the, the typical way to do it is you characterize the, the molecular events that underlie resistance. So this is an example of, a, of an enzyme. It's called beta-lactamase. Um, it inactivates beta-lactam, which are a common type of antibiotic. Um, so this has been very well characterized. You can see you have structure here. This is from Wikipedia, so it's not only characterized, it's disseminated now. Um, and then maybe, you know, once you know that, you can come up with a new drug that, say, blocks this enzyme. Um, or maybe you can add a second antibiotic because you have some resistant cells, so you add a second drug um, to which the cells are not resistant. Um, and so this is absolutely essential, right? We have to have this characterization. But the problem is this is a really uphill battle. And the reason it's an uphill battle, as many of you know, is that bacteria are extremely agile genetically. Um, so it's estimated there are about 20,000 resistance mechanisms across all species of bacteria. Okay, so whenever you use a new drug, bacteria very quickly come up with a way to get around that drug. Um, furthermore, I would say, let's say we characterized all of these 20,000 resistance mechanisms. And let's say we even had a drug for all of them. It's not perfectly clear what we do at that point, right? If you hand me an infection, what do I do? I just give them as many drugs as I can at once. It's not perfectly clear. Um, so, so my lab takes a little bit of a different approach. So I'm a statistical physicist by training. So if you're familiar with statistical physics, um, basically what often happens is you have um, systems that have many, many degrees of freedom. So a classic example is molecules. These molecules interact in some way. So say um, spins of a magnet, uh, water molecules, um, molecules of a liquid, various different things, or of a gas. Um, molecules interact in some way, so these degrees of freedom are coupled in some way. And then when you put them all together, the behavior of the system as a whole is, is often very counterintuitive. It doesn't reflect necessarily the individual molecular or um, specific mechanisms um, at the microscopic level. Okay, so you can see this emergent behavior, it's called. And so this is, um, I, I call it statistical physics, um, but, but there's a very closely related field of complex systems in general now where these types of questions are being addressed. Um, so I think we should... Uh, um, you know, look at these infections as something like a statistical physicist would. So now instead of molecules interacting, we have bacteria cells, or we potentially have drugs. Um, and by doing this, I hope to shift sort of the focus from the list of parts, the molecular mechanisms that are involved in resistance. So this is an example of an efflux pump that pumps out drugs. Um, this is a very common one in E. coli. Um, to the interactions between cells in a population. So this is just a population of Enterococcus faecalis. Um, it, one of the first pictures we took with our microscope, which we, which I had to put in here at some point. And so the question is, you know, how do these parts fit together? So we're not focused so much on just a list of parts, but how do those parts fit together? And ultimately, in terms, when you're dealing with cells, how do they give rise to community behavior, to behavior of an infection as a whole? Um, now, our hope with this, and this is um, admittedly optimistic, but I want to at least tell you what we're, what we're dreaming of, our hope here is that now if we have a population of cells, we don't have to rely purely on solutions that target molecular mechanisms within individual cells. We can potentially instead look also at solutions that target the ecosystem, that target the way these cells interact. 
Um, and, and so that's sort of our goal. That's our hope. Um, that's our, our dream, I guess. Um, and, 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 you know, we hope that, that this can lead to things like new uses for old drugs, right, where maybe a drug isn't so great at, at killing a particular cell, but maybe it disrupts the ecosystem in a particular way. Or maybe this can motivate entirely new classes of drugs. Maybe you could say, you need to mess with, you know, this particular interaction between these two types of cells. And to do that, you can cause a, you know, a sort of a big collapse. Right? This is just sort of the, the big picture uh, of the way we're trying to think about things in my lab. Um, now, what I'm going to tell you about today is one example of, of how I think statistical physics type thinking can get you somewhere. Um, so I'm going to tell you about a really surprising experimental result. We had to use statistical physics to, um, to basically analyze the data that led to this result. Um, but in practice, this result is, is raising a lot of questions. So this is, this is work that I did um, while I was a postdoc at Harvard, so this is now almost two years ago. Um, and I had several collaborators, so Satoshi's a microbiologist who was in my lab at Harvard. Eduardo Sontag, some of you may know him. He's a mathematician at Rutgers. He's a super, super smart guy, really nice. Chris Wood is, is kind of the weak link. He's my uh, younger brother. He's a faculty member at Duke. Um, and then Philippe Clazelle was, um, was my advisor as a postdoc. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start out by saying we, don't, we still don't know the answer to this, which is one reason I chose to talk about this today. So I'm going to give you this sort of surprising result, and then I'm going to um, hope that by the end of the talk you guys will solve it and, and hopefully have a theory paper written up. Um, so the question is one that's very simple. It's how do, how do combinations of drugs affect cell growth? Um, so in our case, the drugs are antibiotic. Um, I keep forgetting I have this thing here. The drugs are antibiotic. Um, the system that we're, we're looking at is a population of cells, typically bacteria. So we'll see E. coli, Staph aureus, a few different types here. Um, and then the output, the thing we're measuring is something that's very simple to measure. It's population growth. So it's just um, you know, the, the increase of the population over time and the exponential rate at which it grows. Um, so you might ask, this is sort of like um, the interest lab, you know, why would you study drug interactions or why would you study drug combinations? Um, well, I'll say they're definitely clinically important in some um, situations now. Tuberculosis, cancer, malaria, HIV are some of the classic examples. Um, it's thought that drug combinations may be sort of the clue or, or may hold additional, sort of provide additional levers for combating resistance. Um, but there's a big problem with drug combinations, and that problem is that a complete molecular or mechanistic description of every system is certainly not known, right? Um, and as a result, you have to, in order to really get a, a good idea of a drug combination, you essentially have to empirically test it. So there, there are possibly exceptions, but um, you can imagine this is a difficult problem. Because if I even gave you three drugs, and I said, okay, you can pick all the different combinations of these three drugs at different dosages, then you would see that the number of combinations can be quite big, even for three. And in fact, if you were to do this for a larger number of drugs, you would find that the number of experiments you need to do um, to characterize a multi-drug combination is going to go up exponentially with the number of drugs, okay, and potentially with the number of doses also. So this is a combinatorial explosion that's very hard to get around. Uh -huh. If you know the problem, you should go for the drug. Sure, sure. You so you're saying if you want to kill something, you should you should use that and try to find, but you still have to sample a very large space of combinations potentially, right? Right. Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you have to take into account both the potential interactions that would lead to side effects, negative um, consequences, and and so in this case we're you know this is very simplified in vitro systems. But but what I'm going to hope to convince you of is that it's not as complicated as we might think it is. And maybe the same thing could apply to side effects. We don't we of course don't know that. Um, okay, so so the question is, can we be predictive? Can we somehow beat this exponential explosion? Um, and so this is something that's very easy to measure. So I, I was a, a theoretical physicist by training. I did my PhD in theory, um, statistical physics theory. Um, and even I could do these experiments. So, um, so, so this is something that's easy to measure. So um, basically the idea is you take drugs, something like antibiotics, you add them to liquid cultures, right? So this is an example in a test tube. In practice, we do them in 96 well plates just so we can get higher throughput. Um, we did add a little bit of stuff. Um, we had a, a commercial plate reader and, and a robotics interface, and then we could customize uh, programs. So we wrote in um, you know, various, uh, various different languages. 
So basically, we could do maybe 400 cultures at a time. And for each of these cultures, you get a growth curve that looks something like this. So everybody that's worked in a microbiology lab has probably done a growth curve by hand. Something um, looks something like this. So this is optical density as a function of time. So optical density is, um, is proportional to the number of cells in an experiment. So this is on a semi-log plot. So essentially, the slope of this line right here gives you the growth as a function of whatever drugs are in your experiment. So it's very, very easy to do, and you can do it in high throughput, and the data is relatively easy to analyze. Um, so it's not a hard experiment. And so the question is, well, why, it's, why is it so difficult to tell what's happening when you add these drugs together? And so I'll start by just the simplest possible example. Let's say I had a drug, I applied it to a cell population, I measured that population's growth, I'll call it G1. Let's say this is a normalized number between 0 and 1. Okay, so 1 is in the absence of drug, 0 is no growth at all. And you can do the same thing with drug 2. I'll call that G2. So what's going to happen now when I put the two drugs together? Anybody have a guess? No? Okay. What's that? The cells are going to die. Probably. <laughs> the simplest possible thing you might think of is you can multiply these two things together. So, for example, um, if this growth were 0.5, so growth is inhibited by 50%, this is 0.5, and when you put them together, maybe you'd expect total growth of 25%. Right? So this is called bliss independence. It's something that developed in 1952. Um, it's been used extensively as a null model for what might happen when you put two drugs together. Um, and bliss independent is great for really simple systems. So um, I played around with a lot of enzymatic models where you, you, know, you take an enzyme and you consider, or, or you consider some enzyme cascade and you consider a drug to be an inhibitor of that enzyme. And then you can use a second inhibitor of a second enzyme in the cascade and you can see what happens when you put the two things together on, say, the flux through the network. And for really simple systems, you can derive bliss independence. Um, so under, more in the line of th that's right. That's right. As opposed to sy systemic multi absolutely yeah. absolutely this is this is that or say um we didn't do the experiments but could apply potentially to things like hiv where you have multi-component therapies but there's all targeting the virus right, yeah. right. anything where you're targeting yeah yeah um so so this is great if you're playing around by hand with you know simple network models you can derive this it works great as soon as your network gets more complicated it doesn't work anymore right and it especially doesn't work when you're applying this to a population of cells, or at least it doesn't work. It often doesn't work. It actually is not so bad in a lot of cases. Um, and that's because the drugs do, you know, what we call interact. Um, so there's two types of interaction, at least for the purposes of this talk. Uh, one is antagonism, where the drugs counteract each other, right? So the total effect is weaker than you would think. Um, one is synergy, where the drugs strengthen each other. So you put two maybe weak-acting um, antimicrobials together, and it completely wipes out the population. Um, so this is an example. So if you've seen me give a talk before, I almost always include this in my talks. Um, this is the very first experiment I ever did. Um, so this is a, a two-dimensional heat map of growth as a function of two drugs. On the y-axis is salicylate, which is actually something like aspirin. Turns out it kills bacteria. So um, to a physicist coming in, I was like, hey, this is the same thing as an antibiotic. Obviously it's not, but again, this is my first experiment. Um, on the y-axis is chloramphenicol. This is an antibiotic, also one that um, you can at least orally give to humans, so MDs will know. Um, and, and this is growth of E. coli in the presence of these two drugs. And what you'll notice here, even in this simple example, you see kind of, kind of cool behavior. So what you'll notice is if you just walk along this axis, so you say no chloramphenicol, and I'm just going to slowly increase the amount of salicylate or, or aspirin, um, what happens is the growth decreases monotonically. right? And, and this point right here, I would say, gives us an estimate of the error of letting a theorist do your experiments for you. Right? But there are much better experiments that show this is a, a monotonic decrease. Um, you can do the same thing around the vertical axis. And when you do that now, you're just increasing uh, the concentration of chloramphenicol. It's an antibiotic, of course, it kills the cell. So um, again, growth is monotonically decreasing, nothing surprising. But if you look higher on the axis, you start to see something interesting. So if I start with a non-zero amount of chloramphenicol and I add salicylate, you see an initial increase in growth and then a decrease. And again, this particular experiment's not great, um, but you could fill this data points in very easily, and this is actually a known effect. So in this particular case, these drugs are very strongly antagonistic. It's called suppression. One actually suppresses the effect of the other. Um, in this case, the reason this happens is salicylate causes an upregulation of efflux pumps in E. coli. Efflux pumps sort of um, indiscriminately pump out a lot of different small molecules, including chloramphenicol. So if your concentration of chloramphenicol when you start is sufficiently toxic, 
then adding something that is also toxic but allows you to get rid of toxic substance one is actually beneficial. Okay. Um, so again, this is a, a particular case that's well understood. Um, what I want you to take home from this is that there's fundamentally new chemistry or new biology that happens when you put the drugs together. And so what that means is if you're trying to understand something that has a combinatorial explosion like this, you need to understand every possibility, right? And they're potentially different. Um, and there's been a lot of great work on trying to characterize the specific drugs, the specific molecular mechanisms that might lead to interaction, okay? So we come from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I, I, when I was first looking at this problem, I thought of it a little bit like a statistical physicist might. What do you want to know? You want to know what happens when you get lots and lots of drugs, right? And you don't care about the relevance at first. You're just, you're just thinking out loud. Um, and what we decided to do is, is not focus on specific drug interactions, but happen, ask what happens as the number of interactions or the number of drugs in, a, pop, in a, a combination increases. And can we see something here that might give us um, some underlying simplicity that's not obvious? Um, so an example, let's say we have three drugs. We might say, let's, know that, let's say that we know the effects of the drugs individually, and maybe we know the effects of the drugs in pairs. So we know what I'll call G13, the effects of, or the growth of cells in the presence of drugs one and three, G12, and G23. And the question is, can I say anything about what will happen when I put all these drugs together, right? And if I can't, that means there's some type of three-body interaction that happens when all the drugs are, are there, something fundamentally new that's going on when all three drugs are there than when they're not all there. And so the question is, can we measure this? Can we find out, first of all, how do pairwise interactions add up to begin with? And then number two, are there three-body interactions? Are there higher-order interactions? And how big are they? So we've got to come up with some system for measuring this. Um, and this is where um, we made an analogy with theoretical statistics. So this is a really beautiful paper from um, somebody in Japan, uh, Shinichi Amari. So some of you may know him if you come from mathematical statistics. Um, he developed this entire framework called information geometry. Um, for basically looking at the curvature of the space of parameter probability distributions. And it's, it's brilliant work. It's, it's quite difficult to get through um, because it's, it's challenging, but it's, it's really beautiful. Um, so we had this paper, um, and, and the idea of this paper was just to decompose dependencies among random variables into dependencies that are purely triplet, purely doublet, purely four-body, five-body. So we're like, okay, this is similar, sort of, right? I mean, there's a large number of variables and there's and we want to see how much of, of the, the randomness of those variables comes from pairs of the variables or cubes of the variables or fourths. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I mean, well, you just ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> Approximate that as a two body a set of two body interactions and be done with it. <laughs> Um, so there was another paper more on the physicist side, um, so, so this is very much from the uh, mathematical statistics community, this is from the, the neuroscience or physics community from Bialik's lab at Princeton. Um, and, and this, he, he did something similar, they defined something called multi-information, which is an analog of like a connected correlation function if you're from statistical physics. But basically they're, they're using information theory and they're de decomposing information carried by in random variables into information carried by smaller subsets of those random variables, pairs, cubes, something like that. And so we said, okay, you know, there's, there's this whole sort of community out there that does, does things like this. So the question is, can we somehow map interactions between drugs to statistical dependencies between random variables? Because if we can, then we can sort of dip into this community and use techniques for trying to estimate how these things might look. And so here's how we do, did this. Um, we said, okay, let's assume that there's some stochastic variable, I'm going to call it Xi. Um, Xi depends on the concentration of drug I. Um, it's governed by some unknown probability distribution. And I, I'm gonna stress here, it's a formal tool. It's not directly, necessarily directly accessible by experiment, certainly not by the experiments we were doing. Now, here's why it's convenient. We can connect it to experiment by postulating that the effects of an in-drug combination, the growth in the presence of in-drug is an in-body moment of this unknown probability distribution. So what we're doing here is by construction, drug interactions are associated with correlations between random variables. Right? So we've set up a, a statistical framework where our measured drug interactions correspond to correlations between random variables. We don't know what those variables are and we don't necessarily care, but now within this framework, we can try to estimate other moments. The problem now becomes, we need to estimate this probability distribution, this unknown distribution I'll call P, from the data. Or to say this um, in another way, we need, to, or, we need to estimate higher order moments, the effects of a large drug combination, in terms of lower order moments, the effects of smaller drug combinations. 
Okay, and there are several ways to do this. So the first way to do this, if we knew more about the system, or more about um, the details, is we could make some physical assumption, right? If we knew what these random variables were, we had a physical model, that would be ideal. We don't have that. Um, but maybe we could say, well, the variables are Gaussian because of the central limit theorem. We could make an argument like that maybe, right? Um, another way to do it is we could use some type of statistical method. Um, and the one we're going to use is called maximum entropy. So many of you, or at least some of you, are probably familiar with maximum entropy. Um, it was introduced, at least to my knowledge, in a series of papers from the 1950s by a guy named James. Um, these are beautiful papers where he re-derives all of statistical mechanics from um, this idea. Um, so the idea of maximum entropy is you incorporate the known information or the constraints. These are provided typically by data. Um, but you, you, you incorporate nothing else. Other than that, you, you want to find the probability distribution that is as random as possible, but it is subject to whatever constraints your, your data give you. Um, and so, like I said, in, in the case of James, you can drive all of statistical mechanics by putting constraints on, say, the energy of the system, um, which is a moment of, of a probability distribution, um, and you end up getting back a Boltzmann distribution. It's, it's a, a beautiful way to derive a lot of statistical physics. So if I gave you an example, and I said, okay, I'm going to give you the mean and a variance of a one-dimensional continuous random variable, and I say, what's the distribution? And you would say, well, I can't answer that. There's many distributions that could have this mean and this variance, right? There's not just one answer. Um, but what you could do is you could, you could maximize the entropy of that distribution subject to constraints on the mean and the variance that I gave you, right? So it's just a problem in calculus of variations. And what you would find when you did your typical Lagrange multipliers is that the distribution that's maximally entropic but has the mean and variance that I gave you is a Gaussian distribution. So there's something kind of satisfying about that, right? You could do the same thing on some finite, um, you know, some, some finite set of numbers on the real line or something, and you get a uniform distribution in that case. So, um, so, there, and, and, um, so all, all of your sort of famous families of distributions pop up from doing this. If I give you just the mean, it comes out to be an exponential distribution. Et cetera. Um, okay, so the idea of what we're going to try to do, we're going to try to take data, which are our two drug effects. We know the effects of the drugs in pairs. We're going to associate those with correlations between random variables. We're going to then try to estimate the distribution that governs um, those random variables. We're going to do that using maximum entropy. Once we have this distribution, we can then predict the effects of a larger drug combination. There's no free parameters here. Right? We measure the effects of the drugs in pairs, and then we predict something that that experiment never saw. We predict what happens when we put these drugs together. Okay? Um, and the question then is, how well does this pairwise approximation predict the data? If it does a really good job, that suggests that higher order interactions are small. If it does a poor job, that suggests that higher order interactions are, are potentially really important. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Well, I, absolutely. So after, actually, when I, um, I gave a similar talk um, when, when I was at, for one of my visits to Michigan, and um, I don't know if you know Hashim. He was uh, previously a faculty member in biophysics. And we got to talking about this same technique. And he used it by basically he, he estimated using a, a, a limited number of correlations he could measure in particular type of NMR measurements. He could he could predict you know higher order angles or something. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Yes. No, no, because you want the distribution that, it, that includes no statistical structure other than what you've constraining it to be. Right? So you want to maximize the entropy. You want to, you want to blow up the randomness of the distribution. Otherwise, it's just going to come to a delta function at your, at your mean, for example. Uh huh. Well, uh, Okay, yeah, so this is, this is outside of the, of the branch of control. I, I see a little bit what you're coming towards. Um, what we're doing here is we have a limited number of measurements. We have some distribution that, that governs those measurements. And we're trying to say, okay, if we're constrained by those measurements, um, what can we say about that distribution? So we're maximizing the entropy as a most unbiased, if you want, estimator of what that distribution might look like. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's more on the parameter estimation than absolutely. It's not a controllability problem at all. Right, well, you're right. This is a whole different, yeah, a whole different problem. 
Okay, so, so we started and, and we took three drugs that all had very similar binding sites. So the specific uh, drugs are not particularly important here, but um, we used basically three protein synthesis inhibitors that all targeted the ribosome. So our thinking was, let's try, to, let's try to find something where all the drug targets are at least somewhat similar. And there's some evidence in the literature that at least in pairs, these drugs give some type of interaction. Um, so let's try to force a three-body interaction on this. So we have lincomycin, um, targets the 50S subunit. Erythromycin also targets the 50S subunit in a slightly different way known to be competitive lincomycin, by the way. Um, and then doxycycline. So again, these are all protein synthesis inhibitors. Um, this targets the 30S subunit of the ribosome. So they all slow down protein synthesis. They all have binding sites that are at least you know, roughly the same within the cell. So we thought, OK, if we're going to see a three-body interaction, this might be a good candidate. Um, and so we asked, what happens when we combine all these together? How large are these three-body effects? Um, and so one thing that was known and that we measured and confirmed is that um, in pairs, these drugs interact actually very strongly. So one and two, lincomycin and erythromycin, are very antagonistic when you put them in pairs. Lincomycin and doxycycline are very antagonistic. And erythromycin and doxycycline are very synergistic. So if I ask you, what's going to happen when I put all these three together? It'd be a little bit hard to say, right? But it turns out it's very easy to measure, right? So this is just an example of the the two D or the plane through two dimension or the three dimensional drug space. These are just growth planes. So you know we tried to just measure random planes, so we got pretty pictures, and then we tried to randomly sample the space in in some relatively naive way to get to get an idea of what this looks like over um, different dosage concentrations. And then now we can compare to our predictions that we made without putting the drugs together, that we made only based on what happens when the drugs are in pairs. Um, so we calculate predictions using data from the pairwise drug interactions. And um, to our surprise, it actually did quite well. Right? So this is, a, this is a, a plot of our experimental growth measurements. These are the predictions. Right? So, this, so you want things to fall along this line. So systematically, there are no major errors. Um, the errors we saw were typically within the bounds of our experimental error. Um, these are actually like 50% confidence intervals. So it actually does really well when you extend it out further. And then if you were to just look at one of these planes, you see that it captures even the sort of non-trivial behavior where you have, say, a curvature there of growth. So we were very surprised by this because we thought, OK, we, we put these three drugs together that all interact in pairs. And, and we thought they would interact even further when we put them all together because they have similar binding sites. Um, so in terms of growth units, you can quantify this in various different ways, including one way with information theory that's based on the maximum entropy distributions. Um, I think a, maybe a simpler way to think about it for a lot of people is just in, in terms of relative growth units, it was 0.02, so it was very small. Um, and so we were surprised, like I said. And so then we said, okay, well, what you have to do next is you have to see how general are three-body interactions. So now we've just got to take a huge list of drugs and we've got to start doing combinations, right? And so we wanted to try to think, what we were hoping for is, well, okay, maybe we can classify which of these drug combinations have three body effects and which don't. And maybe that'll give us some insight into, maybe it'll break down by mechanism. Because there's some, there's some idea out there that pairwise interactions between drugs depend on mechanism of action. So this great paper, actually, where if you take a bunch of pairwise interactions from antibiotics and you cluster them with an algorithm that knows nothing about the mechanisms of the antibiotics, it only knows how they interact with others. And, and the constraint on your algorithm is that you want class A of drugs, however they're classified, to interact with class B of drugs um, in the same way. So all drugs from class A interact the same way with all drugs from class B. And so you create classes of drugs. When you do that, they cluster by known mechanisms of action, which is kind of interesting. Maybe we'd see something like this when we did more drugs. So we did 125 different three drug and four drug combinations. So now this took me a long time. <laughs> this took a long time. 19 different drugs and about 1,500 different dosage combinations. What was remarkable is every single time we saw outstanding fit. Um, this was our worst data set of any, from any one experiment. Um, so you can see even here, there's no systematic variation, right? I mean, there's certainly some points that are outside of it. Um, and what we saw was, you know, excellent agreement. So it depends, you know, you can quantify this in various different ways. Just a very naive way is to take something like an R squared value. You can measure the average three body interaction in terms of growth units, and it's less than 2%. Um, or you can measure it with an information theory method that I'm not going to go over. It also tells you that in terms of, of bits. So I'll briefly say the way you do that is, um, you calculate also the maximum entropy distribution that includes three-body interactions. So that distribution is going to give you all the correct answers. And then you compare how well that distribution does, or the entropy of that distribution versus the entropy of the one you estimated from the pairs, and you can see how much of that entropy is due to higher order effects. And when you do that, it also gives you a small number. So there are not 
emergent phenomenon here. So this was very surprising to us. Um, um, so, so yeah, so what this suggested to us, right? What this suggests, and of course we have to make a huge claim, <laughs> is drug interactions are encoded at the pairwise level. Um, so at least for a large collection of antibiotics, um, this seemed to be true. Um, now what this means in practice is you don't need mechanistic information about every higher order combination of drugs. You do need to know how they interact in pairs, right? So far there's nothing we can do to predict that. But if you know that, there's no mechanistic information beyond that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah. Right. And we, we mixed all different, I forgot to mention, we mixed drugs from all different classes. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. We never found experimentally, never. No. Oh, I mean, you know, these 2% or whatever. But yeah, nothing. And now, by contrast, if I were to assume they were independent and use the bliss independence to try to predict it, way off. Now, I mean, occasionally it'll be close, right? But some of them actually are independent, but, but typically they're way off. So we were very surprised by this. Um, and then we said, well, well, we've got some other organisms lying around, so we've got to try this and other things, right? So we tried it in Staph aureus, because this is a, you know, a more clinically relevant species maybe than E. coli, and we saw the same type of thing. And then I said, hey, my, my kind of dumb younger brother does cancer stuff, so I can, at least I can contact him and we can do it with cancer too. And so we tried it there with breast cancer um, and with melanoma, and we saw the same types of things. Now we didn't look at the cancer case in a lot of detail, um, and we haven't followed up on that as much. That's a good discussion to have because you know there you have a library of different networks and that's you right. know, a library of drugs. You have to go through that. Yeah. That would be. Uh, that would be. That might allow us to systematically look at this. So I didn't talk about this, but um, or I'm not going to talk about this. But you know, it looks like it applies at least across species. Now, what I had on here before, before I get to this. Um, is we did some in silico experiments, um, and, and what I did is I just set up a network that was, it had 15 reactions, you know, so that's, I tried to build in the feedback loop, all the sort of qualitative features you might see in, in um, real pathway. So there were like, um, there were reactions that came together with like an AND gate, something like, you know, you needed all three of them to be on, there were others that came to, all these different things. Um, and then I just, you know, you had 15 interactions, so you can have 15 different inhibitors. And we sampled that for, you know, a day or something and came back was beautiful, <laughs> same type of thing. Uh, there were some outliers, um, but, but you know, that's another thing that we're, we're kind of looking into. So I have an undergrad in the lab now um, who's very, he, he's a, a math student. He's very interested in network theory. So we're trying to see, yeah. It, so we're trying to take it to the, at the very simplest level of just a complex network with a bunch of connections and you take out those connections um, and you define perturbations, you know, how, how, under what conditions are these perturbations you know, do they add up in this way? Exactly. Exactly. And we find some, and there are obvious cases where it wouldn't work. So imagine that I had um, the case I mentioned where you had three pathways. So this is one that we found that was really obvious once we saw it. You have three pathways and all three of them are required for growth. Drug one targets pathway one, drug two, pathway two, drug three, pathway three. You do these in pairs, you're not going to see any big effect, right? You just need one of these three pathways for growth. You do them all three together, you're going to see a huge effect. That type of architecture, or at least doesn't seem to be very prevalent in, in the, you know, if you want to think about it, in the space of networks uh, that are targeted by antibiotics. Right? We'd like to formalize that a lot more, though. Um, OK, so this is something that's even more remarkable. This is remarkable experimentally. This is not remarkable mathematically. Um, so what we found is that even across all these species, the quantitative relationship between the pairwise effects and the end drug effects is always the same. So if I give you the pairwise effects and the single drug effects, and I say, okay, how do they give you a three-body interaction? It always follows something like this, right? So the three-body interactions involve the pairwise interactions, the single interaction. Now, if you guys come from statistics, you will recognize this. This is Wick's theorem, if you're from quantum field theory, or Isserlitz's theorem from statistics, it governs the moment distribution of Gaussian variables. Now, we use maximum entropy, and we basically gave it the mean and the variance of a multidimensional Gaussian. So it's not shocking that we get back um, Isserlis theorem, because our distribution, while not technically Gaussian, has a lot of qualities that are similar to it. So mathematically, mm, not obvious that we would get this relationship, not shocking. Biologically, to me, this is crazy, 
right? This is very surprising that um, the effects of drugs individually, right? We know if we have a drug that works on cell type A and we apply it to cell type B, there is no guarantee it's going to work at all. And furthermore, the effects of the drugs in pairs are going to depend really exquisitely on the cell type, right? We're applying it to a cancer cell versus a bacteria cell, and the drug chemistry. But the way these pairwise interactions add up to give you a higher order interaction seems to be completely independent of cell type and completely independent of drug type, not just qualitatively, but quantitatively. So this is crazy, right? Yeah. And so it turns out that um, around the same time or afterwards, several of these, several labs have found similar things through different methods. Um, and, and they're not always the point of the paper, but if you look at their data, you can see that they're seeing similar effects. Um, so a couple, a couple of these are in bacteria. This is from Uri Alon's lab, who's a um, really great systems bio um, person from Israel. Um, you know, this is from uh, a nature medicine paper from 2013, I think. So they looked at HIV. So um, in this case, they were looking at promoters in bacteria. So now they're not looking at growth rate. They're looking at the individual promoter. And they find that in that case, you can also predict it, at least for a large class of promoters. There were some that you couldn't predict it from. So in other words, you can predict how the promoter responds to a drug combination from the way the promoter responds to a smaller combination. Yeah, it's entirely possible. Or, or at least um, a common network motif or a, a collection. Of that's true. That's true. Yeah, sure. Sure, sure. And this was, you know, again, just in a very simple liquid culture, so um, there's much more complexity. But we were really happy to see that, okay, people can predict the threes from pairs in other um, systems, too. So, like I said, HIV, this one was in, this was uh, predicting protein dynamics from drug combinations in cancer cells. Okay, so again, this wasn't the growth rate of the cells, but it was the dynamics of a particular protein. These were actually time series. This one and this one were time series of protein dynamics or promoter dynamics. And they found that you could predict the entire time series from these pairs. Okay, so um, we think this is very cool. We don't know why. Okay, so if you know why, you have you know, 15 minutes or so um, to work it out and let me know. Yeah, but what are those features? <laughs> if you're in my lab, you can figure that out. We should figure that out. <laughs> in fact, if anybody's going to do it here, I'd prefer it to be somebody from my lab. <laughs> um, OK, so just a practical application. Um, um, we, we're following up somewhat on this. We're more interested in why this happens and, and trying to test that. But, but we are using it a little bit to try to find cell-selective drug cocktails. OK, so I have a, a really good graduate student um, from bioinformatics, a master student, Basil, who's here. We're working on this in Enterococcus faecalis. So we have some resistant strains and some sensitive strains, and we find that the interaction between pairs of drugs change between the two strains. And so the geometry of this higher order space is very unclear. We're trying to find cases where the geometry morphs in such a way that you can get selectivity for the wild type cells in the presence of drug or a drug combination. Um, I think we have some promising leads, but we don't have anything yet. We're also doing it in a couple um, lung cancer and breast cancer cells. Um, and, and we'd started it with uh, Staph aureus um, with, with Philippe, my old advisor. Just to give you an idea, though, um, let's say we had 20 drugs and we want to do eight dosage each. So there's 10 to the 18th different combinations we would need to measure. So let's say I hired a really good postdoc who could do 400 measurements a day. And it's going to take this person about 10 to the 12 years to finish this experiment, which is, which is you know, really hard to fund. So this is no good. Um, so, I mean, to give you an idea what, like, 10 to the 12th years, there's, like, 10 to the 18th atoms on Earth or something. I mean, 10 to the 12 is on the order of the number of cells in your whole body. This is too many years for a grant. Um, now, if you do this with pairwise approximations, you need about 10,000 measurements. You can do it in about one to two months, right? at least in principle, if you're getting 400 measurements a day. This is a pretty big simplification. Right? So pairwise um, scaling goes quadratically with the number of drugs, not exponentially. It's a really big savings. Um, how am I doing on time here? About 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so, so, so we're following up on this in a lot of different ways um, in my lab. So I'm going to tell you just briefly about some of the stuff we're working on now. Um, 
excuse me. So I, I think we're just scratching the surface. I think these types of ideas and, and studying these, sim these systems um, in this way is, at least to, to us, it's very exciting. Um, now, the measurements I told you about, they're pretty limited, right? We have growth curves that only measure the steady state growth rate, basically, here. Um, and what happens is, after some time, you reach the carrying capacity of your environment, and your experiment's basically over then, right? So it turns out that a lot of your experiment's kind of wasted. And this is fine for getting a first-order approximation for how drugs happen or how, how drugs uh, act, but what about dynamics, you know? I mean, in, in a real-life biological scenario, you're going to have cells that are experiencing really dynamic environments, right? Um, and so we found inspiration in, in several papers. Um, this is from the Kashoni lab. Um, this is from um, this is Kashoni lab at Harvard Med School. This is Van Uden Arden lab at MIT. These are both um, physicists turned biologists, so I guess they were uh, thinking similar ways. Um, and and they, they built basically fancy types of chemostats, these chemostats that you can control with the computer. And so that's what we did. So we grow our cultures in these small culture vials. It's extremely simple. This is work that was put together by Jason. Um, he's a grad student in my lab. Um, you grow the cells in these small culture vials. Um, we went to the machine shop and we had them house this basically multi-cup holder, right? So we have 15 of these cup holders. Each cup holder on the side can take um, an LED and a detector, which we bought at Radio Shack, do a little bit of electronics, hook it up to a computer. Um, now you can measure light scattering, right? You can correlate this with absorbance. Um, so we have 15 of these, so we can do it in, you know, not high. Well, we have 15, we only have four set up right now, so we're trying to set up more of them. Um, and you can pump in and out up to four drugs or nutrients or whatever you want, and you can do this over time dynamically. Um, then we can control it all with the computer um, with you know, some relay cards and uh, data acquisition cards. It's very, very simple, right? There's some, a few electric circuits that were, that were very simple put together. Um, so it's, it's a simple setup, but it's, it's pretty powerful, we think. Um, so this is just an example of one of our first calibration experiments. So we let, first we let E. coli grow, so there's just the red growth curve. So now instead of having to take a measurement, say, by hand every 20 minutes, we take, I don't know, 10 measurements a second and take the median of those, and, and we can let it go for overnight. Right? So, so you get these, you know, of course, very nice growth curves. Another thing we can do is, um, by the way, this is just a calibration plot of the voltage we measure in our circuit versus the optical density of the cell, so there's a, a good linear correlation. The other thing we can do is we can hold the cell population at a given density. And we can do that by turning on pumps that pump in fresh media. Okay, so if we want to hold the, the cells that say an optical density of 0.2, we can do that, right? Um, and we can do that by turning these pumps on and off, and then we can look at how often the pumps turned on and off, and we can infer the growth rate over time. Okay? Um, so we like this because we think we can mimic more realistic infection dynamics. Um, we can hopefully eventually start to ask clinically relevant questions. We're, we're far from that now. We're very much basic scientists. Um, and, and so like one question that we looked at right away is what role does cell density play in antibiotic efficacy? So there's something called the inoculum effect that people may be aware of. It's the idea that drug efficacy is going to depend on the starting number of cells in a population. Okay, so this is a well-known effect. Um, one thing about this effect, though, is it's a little bit difficult to interpret. Because if I asked you, well, how does it depend on cell density? You can't say for sure. Because the way people do the experiments, which are often very clever, is they will take a population of cells and they will measure the MIC, the minimum inhibitory concentration um, of drug that will inhibit growth of those cells. Well, to do that, growth has to go beyond some threshold. Right? And then you can say there's growth or there's no growth. As a result, the density is changing throughout the experiment. So this certainly implies a density dependence. It says that, yes, yeah, something about the cells starting in a higher population versus a lower population can give you different efficacy. It doesn't give you a direct measure of that. Um, on the other hand, with something like this, you can get that direct measure pretty easily. So we can hold the cells at any given um, optical density. This is a case where we held them at a high optical density. The case where we held them at a low optical density. Um, and we expose them to the exact same amount of drug in both cases, the exact same concentration. This is doxycycline. Um, these are enterococcus faecalis, by the way. So you can tell just by looking that something different is happening here, right, when we hold these cells here. You can look at the pump status then, and you can see at the high-density case, the pumps are coming on a lot. That means the cells are growing faster. In the low-density case, the pumps don't come on much at all. And you can do this as a function of cell density. And you, this was um, an original curve. We have updated data that's better than this, but I didn't change the slide. And you see, um, at least in this case, this sort of very strong increase in growth rate as a function of cell density, or a very strong decrease in antibiotic efficacy. Um, this is the optical density versus time curve, and I'll just note that we're staying in this exponential region. Right? So it's not like we're getting up here in the, uh, in, in the saturated region. So this is cool, we think, because once we have this direct measure of growth or drug efficacy as a function of density, 
Now we can say, well, how would this affect an optimal drug dosing schedule? What actual effect would this have? And while we can't mimic clinical situations, we can certainly do this mathematically. Um, so to quantify this rigorously, we use um, optimal control theory. So in this case, we're scheduling drugs. We're deciding when and how much drug to use at a given time. We're not doing things like flying rockets, which is where you might see optimal control. Um, one of the common, many of you probably know optimal control, those that don't. Um, one of the common problems is, you know, you have to get from here to the moon and you have a steering wheel on your rocket ship and you have to, and, and the gas pedal and the brake, and you have to decide how to apply the gas and the brake and how to steer it to minimize fuel, but still land on the moon. So it's basically a way of, it's an optimization where, um, that involves a dynamical system, essentially. Um, so we do this, um, in this case, we do it numerically because these are really nonlinear models. Um, and, and what you can see, at least, um, I, I did, just did a quick calculation with, with this effect right here, which, again, this is early data. I'm not convinced this is exactly what it is. But you can find that if you do the optimal control and you compare it to the case where you didn't know about this density dependence, is there any savings you could get since these are both mathematically optimal? We can say something rigorously about it. And in this case, you can see you can get a, basically the same effect at about half the dose of drug use. You could save drug, or you could reduce the cell number with the same dose. And so it's important to know about these density dependent effects, at least in an optimal sense, if you want the optimal treatment strategy. And so the point here is that interactions matter, right? These cells aren't living by themselves. Um, another thing I'll just very quickly mention is we're trying to figure out ways to measure um, population dynamics when you have collections of cells, right? So collections of phenotypes. So, so far, I just had a homogeneous population. Let's say I had a mixed population that involved uh, sensitive cells and resistant cells. And maybe it didn't just have one resistant cell, it had multiple types of resistant cells. You can make arguments for the probability of things like this popping up. Um, and they are certainly relevant in some situations. And you can imagine that these things will interact in different ways. So for example, this has been uh, shown recently by a group at MIT. Um, some cells make an enzyme that deactivates drug, like beta-lactamase that I talked about at the beginning. Um, Beta-lactamase, though, doesn't just benefit the cell who's making it. It's a community good that benefits everyone because it breaks down the drug, the toxicity in the environment goes down. And so potentially, um, there are collective effects that arise from that. And there's a really nice paper that came out um, in I think it was Molecular Systems Biology um, it's a couple of months ago where they looked at this exact problem and they showed that if you have an inhibitor of this enzyme, you would think that would reduce the resistance in the population. And at some concentrations, it does because it gets rid of the resistance mechanism. But if you pick the wrong concentration, it actually can make the population stronger, more resistant. The reason it's more resistant is because you can't have a cheater anymore. You can't have a cell who doesn't make the enzyme but benefits from his neighbors making it. There's very interesting effects here. We're looking at a similar effect with efflux pumps, um, where we think, in this case, this is a public bad. The cells are making efflux pumps. They pump out drugs. There's an excluded volume effect. So if you have high enough density of cells, you potentially have a more toxic environment in the presence of efflux pump cells than not. We're building mathematical models and, and trying to measure this with, um, with several experimental techniques. Um, one of them that I don't have time to, to really talk about, but, um, but I want to briefly mention is, is a way that we've come up with to, to study mixed populations. So this is ongoing work. The idea is very simple. This is work that uh, Brendan in my lab's done. So um, Brendan's here. Um, so it's very hard to measure population dynamics if there are many cell types, right? I mean, it's easy to measure it if we just want to know the total number of cells. We just look at light scattering or something. We want to know how many of each cell type there are. Sure, we can use fluorescence if there's a few cell types. What happens if there's five or 10? Now it gets hard. Um, so basically what we're doing is we developed an assay that, that involves next generation sequencing and, um, and, and this dynamics assay. The idea is we put in each cell type a short uh, 10 to 20 nucleotide segment of DNA that we're going to call a barcode. So this is something that labels that cell type. Around that barcode, we have a consensus sequence for which we can design PCR primers and therefore pull out that barcode, those barcodes from any given population. And then we use a few tricks so that we can pull lots of these experiments together. So specifically, we, we label the PCR primers with an additional barcode. We send this off for next generation sequencing. Um, we're actually hoping to send our first batch of data um, this week or next week um, to actually try it out. We've done some, of, some tests with Sanger sequencing, and it looks like it's working. Um, but that's, that's a very slow way to do it, because we have to do each sequencing run individually. But the idea here is. We can do this at many different time points, and we can reconstruct population dynamics of an arbitrarily large number of cells. And in fact, we have huge overkill on sequencing power here for what we're doing, so it's nice. Um, hopefully, next time I give a talk here, we'll, I'll show you some of this data. This is made up. Um, OK, so in summary, what I want you to bring home from this is um, it looks like, at least you know, in our hands, pairwise interactions are sufficient to predict three and four drug interactions. We didn't look much higher than that. Um, there were experimental errors that came into play that just made it hard to make predictions beyond that. 
um, which suggests that biochemistry or cell biology of these drugs is in some, in some magical way encoded at the pairwise level, right? At least that's what we like to say when we give talks. Um, and what's really remarkable, though, in, in all seriousness, is that the accumulation of these pairwise effects seems to be independent of the cell and drug type. Um, so, of course, we're going to say, or of course it's true that you, we have to have the biochemical, the molecular biology analysis, right? I mean, no way saying that that's not necessary, that's absolutely <laughs> essential. But it's cool that some aspects of this multi-drug response seem to be independent of detailed molecular mechanisms, okay? And that does have a hint of, of what I remember seeing once upon a time in statistical physics, right? This is a big part of statistical physics, is this independence of molecular detail. Um, so I think it raises a lot of new questions. Like I said, we don't know the answer to them. Um, so, so please feel free to chat anytime. Um, so my collaborators for the, the pairwise work uh, with, again, Philippe, uh, the whole lab there was great. Um, Eduardo, like I said, is a, a fantastic mathematician. Um, he, he was really fun to work with. My brother Chris, um, Satoshi was a microbiologist. And then everybody in my lab right now, in particular, um, Jason built the instrument that you saw. Um, Jeff is now working on it uh, with him and doing some uh, density dependent measurements and Brendan's working on the, or actually, sorry, Brendan and uh, Brian are working on the sequencing. So um, thanks, guys. That's great. It's wonderful. It's fun to see biophysics again, too. Uh, on the statistical physics analogy, I mean, one of the things that um, statistical mechanics gives us is kind of a, you know, it's an ensemble of different kinds of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. behaviors, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the things that I think uh, I'm wondering about is, you know, you might have different kinds of behaviors, different, you know, ways that different drugs interact with subpopulations sure. in the ensemble sure, as sure. opposed to just treating it as a population as average looking at the ensemble. And I'm wondering if there's a way, because with the antibiotic resistance, isn't it just a few bugs over here Absolutely. that do it, maybe on the right, edge? Right. And, and even, even before we get to resistance, just the phenotypic differences in the response to drugs could give you a lot of popula population heterogeneity. So what we're measuring could, could very well be a bimodal population of growth rates, and we're seeing as you know, something approximating an exponential growth. Um, you know, we're, not, we're not looking a lot at that. Um, we do a little, we're starting to do some microscopy with biofilms, um, and we want to see you know, similar types of things with biofilm. So that will be a little more single cell level, although we tend to look at, or, or at least the plan now is we're looking at a little bigger link scales than single cells to try to see sort of large correlation structures in the biofilms and how those are affected by drugs. So then again, we get to something that reminds us of statistical, statistical physics, because we have correlation functions we can measure very rigorously. We can try to, um, to associate that with drugs and then pull on all the machinery from, from statistical physics and say, okay, can we simplify this to a really, is this sort of like, when the case of the drug, this came out to be an icing model. The drugs interact like an icing model that has pairs, right? And you can do it with spins, even. So we redid all, the whole calculation with spins, and then you can do time-dependent perturbation theory and show that Isserlis theorem is going to, not time-dependent, but um, time-independent perturbation theory, show Isserlis theorem is going to hold in the limit of small coupling, which we saw. So. so it's cool, because, you know, you see something experimentally that's obviously much more complicated, but we can map it hopefully, in, you know, in the best cases, to a really simple model. So uh, I have two questions. Um, so the pairwise interaction sometimes depart from a single, simple formation of a single drug. Yes, that, often, very often. often. That could, could that be predictive of which would likely to have higher order interaction? So if, uh, that's a good question. So we haven't looked at that specifically. Now what I can say is if you do the same analysis but you try to predict pairwise interactions from single interactions, you get back bliss independence. You get back the, the old model um, that's used often. Um, we haven't looked specifically at, at that question. My second question is about uh, quantitatively about the power. If the higher order departs from independence, is your experimental setup, do you have enough data points to truly detect? Or can you say how much the departure ought to be for you to detect it? Yes, and, and it, was within, um, it was within our experimental measurements. We, ha we had a small number of data points that we could not statistically say whether they were unlikely by chance or they were actually deviations from three-body interaction. So that's why we put the number at somewhere around 2 or 3 percent that you know, we, we didn't have essentially the power to, to, make, to make statements about those. 
good, very good question. So, I was wondering if you think it's really, um, it's a fundamental limit on the complexity of biological systems that you can predict the third order effects or if this is more kind of an artifact of antibiotics and their mechanism of killing. Uh, like, I don't know if you're familiar with Jim Collins' work that yes. well, they have all these different parent targets right, that are all right, killing right. the cell through some common um, reactive oxygen species damage. And then although that's, that's becoming a controversial idea, um, I wonder if you did the same sort of thing by making targeted genetic perturbations instead of using antibiotics, if you would see the same sort of predictability. Really good question. So at first we thought this was, so the, the question is, is this something that's specific to the way antibiotics work or maybe growth pathways since antibiotics tend to target those? Is it something about the structure of those or is it something that applies um, maybe to individual genetic components or something? Now there are two of the, the studies I mentioned, uh, one in bacterial with promoters and one with the cancer cells and proteins, did it at a more individual level. And they were not using antibiotics, although they were, they were using, in fact, in one case, they weren't even using drugs. They, they used nutrients in some cases. They used various perturbations. Um, our first thought was that it did have something to do probably with the architecture of the networks that tend to be targeted by antibiotics. We wanted to formalize that in some way. Um, I'm now starting to think maybe it's more general. Um, I also, the, you know, the undergrad in my lab, Cyrus, who's worked on this, um, he, um, so he, he's a really remarkable guy. He's a, he's a freshman and he's very, very excited and he, he built a, a simulator and at some point he, he started doing something that was totally different basically. But he had this simulator and he could perturb it. And I was like, well, why don't you try if you perturb it with pairs of these perturbations? And it, it worked remarkably well. I used this exact same equation. We don't know what's going on. It's starting to feel like, it's starting to feel like a bug in the code somewhere, you know? <laughs> For a long time I was like, how does this keep working? All right, well, thanks, Kevin. All right, thank, thank you. you.